When you sit down and you open the Bible to read it, you can be just as sure that this is God's truth as Abraham believed it was God's truth when God spoke it to him right out of heaven. Just as sure. Isn't any difference. Now, how powerful is that? I mean, does that give you some incentive to want to spend time getting to know the God of this book? Now, that said, not everybody believes this. Not everybody who calls himself a Christian believes in the inspiration and the infallibility and the sufficiency of Scripture. Because you see, around the early part of the 20th century, there were many leading theologians in schools like Yale and Harvard and Princeton. And I don't know if you know this or not, but those colleges were founded to teach men how to, young men how to preach the gospel. But they slipped away from all of that. And many leading theologians said, well, look, Jesus is inspired, but, but, but the scripture, the Bible is a fallible book. And that gained some ground. But then in the middle part of the 20th century, a movement grew up that's called neo-orthodoxy. And in the neo-orthodoxy, the leaders said, well, the scripture is a fallible book, but God still speaks his word through it. The point being the word of God and scripture are not the same thing or said another way, the scripture is not the word of God, but it contains words of God. Now, a a long time ago, a decade or so ago, during this period of my life, I was I used to meet with a group of men and we, we called, called this thing a round table and there was a group of believers and unbelievers and we would talk about God and life and faith and the way it worked was everybody was supposed to come with at least one question and then we would look at what the Bible said about their questions. Anyway, one night there was this older man there who had grown up in a mainline denomination and he asked this question. He said, why are there so many different Christian denominations? Why can't we just have one church? And I thought that was a great question. And so I said, well, there are a lot of reasons we could talk about, and those, you know, we could talk about this for weeks and weeks and weeks. But one way to look at it is you could say some churches believe that all the words in the Bible are God's word. From cover to cover, it's all God's word. The Bible is God's word to us. But there are other churches that teach that this book contains the word of God and it's up to you to decide what's from God and what's from people. It's up to you to decide what's divine and what's human, you decide. And the man said, oh, that's what my preacher believes. And I was thinking he meant, oh, the Bible is God's word, the first one. And so I said, so your preacher believes the Bible is God's word from cover to cover. And he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, the second one, the Bible contains the word of God, and we have to decide what we think is from God and what's just human opinion. Neo-orthodoxy is alive and well in Greenville today. Listen, Paul will have none of that. Paul is able to say that Scripture is so divine that it had a being in the mind of God Before it was written down, and Paul says that the word of God, every part of scripture is living and active, is spirit uh, spirit inspired and spirit empowered. And he says the scripture foresaw and preached the gospel way back in Abraham's time. That means you can trust it, every part of it, and you can trust every part of yourself to it. So the first point is you can only understand the gospel through the scripture are said in reverse, are negative. You can't understand the gospel unless you understand scripture. And to understand scripture, you have to understand that it's all inspired, infallible, and sufficient. Now, that's the first idea. Second idea is this. You can only understand scripture through the gospel. You can only understand scripture through the gospel. Or said in the negative, you can't understand scripture apart from the gospel. Now, many Christians look at the Old Testament and they say, well, the Old Testament's about a whole lot of things. I mean, there's history and law and there's lots of rules and laws and regulations and rituals and tabernacle and temple building stuff. And, and there's poetry, some beautiful poetry in there. But, it, you know, the Old Testament is really not about the gospel. Yeah, sure, there are some prophecies about Messiah there. But on the whole, the Old Testament is the Old Testament. It's just not really about Jesus It's just not true. It's just not true. All those things, history, law, poetry, prophecy, everything written in the Old Testament 
points to Jesus. In fact, you see, there's no real need for you to see Scripture as inspired, infallible, and sufficient if you don't understand what it's all about. And the text tells us how to understand the Old Testament. So remember what's going on here. Paul is talking to these Galatians who've been listening to false teachers who have been telling them, if you want to be a real Christian, if you want to be a, then, then you need to become a son of Abraham and you need to follow the law of Moses. You need to be circumcised and obey the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, the clean laws and the unclean laws and the laws concerning observing certain holy days. And this is what he's been talking about all through, or what we've been talking about all through the series in Galatians. And Paul's been saying, the reason that you're slipping back into a rule-based religion, the reason you're all messed up about these things is you don't understand how the ceremonial laws all are about Jesus. The showbread on the altar is about Jesus. The candlesticks were about Jesus. The tabernacle was about Jesus. The temple, the priesthood, the sacrificial lamb, the scapegoat, everything is all pointed to Jesus. The clean laws were about Jesus. The Ten Commandments were about Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. Everything in the Old Testament leads to, points to, and is fulfilled in Jesus. He's saying you have to see it's all one story. Uh, it's all uh, a story that's pointing to Jesus. And he's making this so clear, and he will make it so clear. We'll get into this more next week. But down in verse 10, Paul says, just look at the law. He says, if you think the law is just about the law, rule keeping, if you think that you can make yourself acceptable to God by keeping the law, then you better listen carefully to the law because the law says, verse 10, 310, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. All things. If you think you can do that, Keep everything in the law. You're not really listening to the law because the law is actually saying, if you really listen to me, if you really understand me, then you'll see that you need a savior. Then you'll see you'll never be able to do everything I tell you to do. You'll never succeed. That's why you need a savior. See it? If you really understand the law, it will lead you to, it will lead you to see your need for Jesus. If you read the law as if it was about the law, you'll never understand it. If you read the ceremonial law as if it's all about ceremonial laws, you'll never understand them. If you read the stories of Abraham and David as simply being stories about Abraham and David, you won't understand them. Jesus says this exact thing in John chapter 5. He's being attacked by the religious leaders of his day. And listen to what he says in John 5, 37. He says, and the father who sent me has testified about me. How? How has the Father testified about Jesus? He says, you've never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you don't have his message in your hearts because you don't believe in me, the one he sent. Now, here it is, verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me and receive life. On the final day, it isn't I who will accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, in whom you put your hopes. If you really believed in Moses, look at this, you would believe in me because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? Now, how clear is that? Jesus says that all the Jewish scriptures point to me. Moses wrote about me. You see, you can't understand the scripture unless you come to it through the gospel. And Jesus says the same thing in Luke 24. This time he's speaking with his disciples after he was raised from the dead. He appears to two unnamed disciples walking home to Emmaus and they're in deep despair because Jesus has been crucified and they've given up hope and Jesus shows up. He pulls up beside him. They don't know who he is and he says, what's happening, guys? And they say, well, we were hoping that this Jesus of Nazareth would be our Messiah, the one who would redeem Israel, but the religious leaders end up crucifying him. And now we're, you know, like we're just sad and dejected. And so he says, verse 25, and Jesus said to them, oh, foolish ones. That sounds like Galatians, doesn't it? Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? 
and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see in this, and then later on, in the same chapter, down in verse 45, 44, he's, he's, uh, he appears to the, his disciples back in Jerusalem, and he says to them, these are my words that I spoke to you when I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, and he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now that passage right there, Luke 24, is one of the key passages that helped me make the turn from seeing the Bible as simply a book full of doctrines and rules and principles and example stories to seeing it that all scripture is telling one unified story pointing to and culminating in Jesus, Luke 24. And man, don't you wish you could have been in that Bible study that evening with those disciples and heard Jesus explain how the, old, all, uh, the whole Old Testament points to him. This is what the whole Old Testament was about. It's all about him. I, I tell you, I've been praying for over a decade now asking God to open my mind to understand the scriptures as Jesus explained it to those disciples. And here's the deal. If you read any part of scripture as pointing only to itself, if you read the stories of Abraham or Moses or David and you think that those stories are telling you to be like those men, if you think that the Bible, with all its, of its laws and rules and principles and proverbs, is telling you to try harder to do better, you'll miss the point. You'll miss the point. Just read the book of Judges. We studied through Judges back in, the, in winter, spring of 2022. Those guys, let me put this gently, none of them are good, solid, moral examples to follow. None of them. But that's not what these stories are about. It's not, those stories are about God. Those stories are about how faithful God is in keeping his promises to Abraham. Those stories are about how God is faithful to deliver his people. God is faithful to deliver. Even when his people are faithless, he remains faithful in order to keep his promise to Abraham. That in you all the nations will be blessed. Those stories are about God keeping his promise, which is ultimately fulfilled in and through the deliverance provided for us once and for all in Jesus. And so you see, if you read the book of Judges as if it's about Gideon and Jephthah and Deborah and Samson, if you read the book of Judges as if it's about the judges, you'll be reading it like Aesop's fables. You're going to be saying, ah, oh, the moral lesson here, grasshopper, is that if we clean up our act, if we really trust God more, if we're really strong, then we can overcome our enemies. No, 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 no. If you read Bible stories like that, if, um, uh, um, uh, let me say it this way. If you read Bible stories like that apart from the Bible story, you read it to your detriment because you'll think, that the moral lessons of those stories is something you have to live up to when the fact is you'll never be able to. Again, hear me. If you, read, if you read the Bible, simply to find a command to obey, an example to follow, a sin to avoid, a promise to claim, a doctrine to believe. That's how I was taught. Did you, have you see, you've seen that list? Yeah. That's the way you read the Bible and you try hard to do those things, it'll crush you because you'll think, I have to live up to this, I gotta do this, I gotta try harder to do better, and the problem is you making it all about you. But the Bible is God's story, it's about him, it's about his plan, his purposes, his promises to Abraham being fulfilled in and through Jesus, and that's all been passed on to us. It's all one story. All that's packed into verse eight right there. The scripture preach the gospel to Abraham. One more time, apart from scripture, you'll never understand the gospel. Apart from the gospel, you'll never understand scripture because all scripture, all of it from Genesis to maps comes from God to show us who God is and what God is like and what God has done, is doing and will do through Jesus. It is the job of every passage of scripture to preach the gospel to us and it is the job of every passage of scripture to invite us to live our lives within God's story. 
And I'm telling you, God's story can shape your life in a way that no command or principle or example or doctrine can. That's the power of story, the power of God's story. You see, all of life is to be lived in the awareness that God's story is coming true and you're living in that story. All of life. You raise your children to live into God's story. That's the goal of parenting. Your marriage is to be a reflection of God's faithful, forgiving, persevering love story with his people. Your schooling, your studies are preparing you to live into God's story in a very specific way. Your work is how God provides you with the resources to sustain you and to propel you forward in God's story. You see in this, God's story can keep, if you're living in God's story, it can keep you from being sucked in to the world's idolatrous stories. Worship is about responding to and proclaiming the glory of God's story. What you give and what you do in this church, serving inside the walls and outside the walls, you do with a community of other believers who are serious about living into and out of God's story in our homes and in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our city, in our world, in our day, in our time, and in our geography. And let me just say this. Regardless of what happens to America's story in the upcoming election, and let me just say, you really do need to take seriously the privilege and responsibility to vote. I read something the other day that George Barna said 32 million Christians are not going to vote. When we live in a country where the right to vote is one of our fundamental freedoms, a freedom that in a very real way factors into freedom of speech and freedom of worship. And when I say freedom of worship, I mean freedom to practice your faith as you see fit and to raise your children in your faith as you see fit. And to my thinking, both of those freedoms, speech and worship, are more and more in jeopardy. And so I pray that you will take your freedom to vote seriously. But regardless of what happens to America's story in the upcoming election, it will not change the outcome of God's story. Amen. It will not change the outcome of God's story. And, and, and you and I can find great comfort and joy in that. You see, we're in the final act of the story. Church age, what comes next is the kingdom. And we're living in the final chapter. And from what we read in scripture, we can look back and see what God has been doing for the last 4,000 years of history, even farther back than that. It's all here in this book. This book shows us the story we're living in. It shows us the story you're living in, whether you acknowledge it or not, you're living in this story. And you see, the great temptation is for us to try to write our own little stories rather than play our part in God's story. This book, all of it, Old Testament, New Testament, this story is your story. It is my story. It is our story. That's what Paul is trying to get the Galatians to see. 2,000 years ago, he was saying, this is your story, Galatians. Don't get pulled off. It's a by grace, through faith story, in Christ alone story. And see, when you read the Bible as your story, you know what? You'll find that as you learn to read it this way, you won't have to discipline yourself to read it. Because you're not looking for a promise to claim and a command to obey and a rule to follow. You're looking for how God, show me yourself and show me what it looks like for me to be a man or woman of faith walking with you, living in your story. And it's something you have to learn to do. You have to learn to read this way. And I've told you, I've been learning to read scripture like this for over a decade now, and I'm still learning. But what I want is I want us to keep on learning to read the story this way, to read it the way it was meant to be read, so we can together learn to live out God's story as this people in this place in this time. Because the gospel story is the ultimate goal of all Bible reading. 
because the gospel story is the ultimate goal of life. It's all meant to draw us into God's story.